Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I would like in this lecture to discuss what we may call the judicial machinery of the legal system of ancient Athens. And in order to do that, we'll begin by examining the three important components of this machinery, that is the magistrates, which would be the archons and other elected officials, secondly, the courts, and lastly, the private and public arbitrators. Uh, in doing so, we can again see the importance the Athenians attached to law and their readiness to participate in the legal system, perhaps more of their readiness than and their zeal uh, than to take part in the political life of the city, actually. Now, the magistrates we've already met. In the Bronze Age period, justice, we recall, was dispensed by the kings and perhaps also the tribal elders. By the Archaic period, in the case of Athens, for example, the Areopagus had control of political and judicial life. Day-to-day -day administration was in the hands of annually elected archons, who had a number of functions, presumably the same ones that the kings used to have. And these magistrates would hear disputes amongst themselves and decide the outcomes. But their arbitrary dispensation of justice was countered somewhat once Solon had introduced the Heliaia, which we recall is the Court of Appeal. <clears throat> now, although the courts dispensed justice, no case came to court until the appropriate magistrate said so. In other words, the magistrates also had a role in the judicial process because they acted as a sort of middle stage or clearinghouse of indictments. If someone had a dispute or wanted to lay a charge against another person, he would first approach the relevant magistrate to put forward his case. And we're going to begin in this initial part of the lecture tonight uh, looking at and discussing various types of suits and their appropriate magistrates. The magistrate would then decide whether the case had legal grounds or not, standing, we might say nowadays, and if it did, he would then assign it to a court. If he thought the charge was dubious in any way, or if the matter was settled to the satisfaction of both parties outside of court, then the courts were not involved. Sometimes the plaintiff might want to bypass the court system and use an arbiter uh, and will come on to arbitration shortly. Now, each of the archons, uh, that would be the three archons, the Basileus archon, the Polymarchus archon, and the eponymous archon. These are these, you know, chief officials, chief magistrates in the city of Athens. Each of these had various political duties, as we know. But here, we're only concerned with their judicial duties. The archons were responsible for different suits, and the document known as the Athenian Constitution tells us um, that these suits included private and public offenses. So the Basileus Archon, as we might expect, dealt with cases involving religion, which were mostly public ones. These included, for example, impiety. Uh, that would be if somebody perhaps attacked someone else at a religious festival, you know, with the things like the city Dionysia, with all that wine flowing, something like that probably was not that uncommon to happen. Um, and these things also included disputes over the allocation of priesthoods. Uh, and these sorts of disturbances at festivals were taken seriously because the offense to the gods, uh, you know, could have, you know, that if there were violence at a festival, that could have dramatic repercussions for the whole city if it were not dealt with in the proper manner. And so the Basileus Archon had jurisdiction over these kind of things, and he also had jurisdiction over any dispute involving a priest, over homicide suits that were brought by an individual against an alleged murderer, or for that matter, by a victim's family against the alleged murderer. And if you are familiar with the Socratic, the Platonic dialogue known as the Euthyphro, you'll remember that it begins with the figure of Socrates sitting on the steps of the Basileus Archon, waiting to be, uh, waiting to go have his uh, initial preliminary stuff heard by him, and uh, and he meets there a young man, Euthyphro, who is bringing a charge of murder against his own father. Well, the eponymous archon dealt with all family and property matters, such as inheritance, guardianship matters, involving orphans and heiresses, any maltreatment of orphans or heiresses, and insanity cases that involve squandering of property, uh, whether someone had abused his parents or not buried his parents in accordance with the laws. Those are all held by the, those all, or all cases dealt with by the eponymous archon. And that leaves the Polymarchus archon, 
and he dealt only with private suits, not public ones. Apparently, what came before the Palamarchus Archon involved the medics, that is, the resident aliens of Athens, the Metoikoi. And the Athenian constitution tells us that the Palamarchus Archon did for medics what the eponymous Archon did for citizens. So these cases could range from a medic committing a crime to inheritance matters involving a medic's estate. When a foreigner became an Athenian citizen, which rarely happened, but it did happen occasionally, he was supposed to have a sponsor who uh, had to be a full citizen. Any foreigner who didn't have a sponsor or who had abused his sponsor in some way or was under the jurisdiction, uh, sorry, would be then under the jurisdiction of the Polymarchus Archon. Incidentally, having a sponsor, something is rather similar, kind of the equivalent today of sponsoring a family to move to America. Uh, it, is, it is something that is also required of people when they kind of begin the legal immigration process to America. Presumably, as litigation increased and the Archons had to deal with more claims, they found that they couldn't cope with them all. There were only so many hours in the day, and so therefore they delegated some of these tasks to the Thesmothetai. Uh, these Thesmothetai, you recall, were the kind of um, they may have begun as something akin to secretaries, as we talked about in an earlier lecture. Um, but certainly by the 4th century BC, they had judicial powers that included assigning the days on which the courts met and introducing various public and private cases to court. Um, and these cases included public ones, such as non-citizens masquerading as citizens, the graffe paranomon, which uh, we talked about in an earlier lecture, bribery, and failure to register as a debtor. Um, those in debt to the state were denied various political and judicial rights until they discharged their debts. And if they died before they could do so, the debt was passed on to their children. Private suits included mining and commercial ones, where a slave had abused a free man, and also perjury before the Areopagus. The Thesmothetai also introduced the Euthune, or the reckoning, uh, really what it was, was the scrutiny of elected officials. The Athune was a kind of scrutiny of the magistrate's year in office, and if that magistrate were to be found corrupt or to have to have been found to discharge his, his duties um, uh, improperly, he was not allowed to enter the Areopagus, and he might even have to face criminal charges in a court of law. We don't know what form the Athune took, but it apparently was the balance to the dokimasia, uh, which was the inquiry into those putting themselves forward as candidates for election to political office. Passages from a speech by the late 4th century BC orator Donarchus give us some idea of the questions asked at the dokimasia, and these were both technical and moral. They included whether the candidate had legitimate children, whether he treated his parents well, whether he owned land in accordance with the laws, whether he had served in the army on campaign, or even whether he had paid his taxes. Most of these stipulations strike us as reasonable, I think, and we often hear the same sort of things being trotted out today by candidates for political office, you know, this guy didn't pay his taxes or whatever. Um, the one about owning land appears a little bit odd, However, it refers to someone who owns land or a house, which is obviously on a plot of land, that he had acquired legally. So you see, that there's, um, there's a legal aspect to that. Presumably, if our candidate were found to have neglected some of these legal niceties during his term in office, then he might still fail his Euthune. The Athenian legal system also had in it magistrates who had specific technical or professional duties for the job that they did, and these made them responsible for cases in their own particular areas. Uh, these were akin to public prosecutors, if you like, and they included officials who were in charge of trade and the marketplace. These were called the agoranomoi. Um, uh, then there are also, that is, people who are officials who are in charge of the of trade and the marketplace. Um, then there are also officials who are in charge of the grain supply, called the Sita Fulakes. And these men were also responsible for allegations of bad business practice. For example, the Sita Fulakes were especially important 
given the reliance of Athens on imported grain from the Black Sea area. And then there were also the 10 strategoi, or generals, uh, that had been instituted, you recall, during the reforms of Cleisthenes. These dealt with cases, obviously not in terms of their military duties, but just we're talking about their legal duties here. They dealt with cases that involved military crimes, as we might expect, crimes such as throwing away one's shield in battle, which would, of course we would call that simply desertion or cowardice, trying to get out of military duty, something like that. All of these actions were indictable, and if one was found guilty, uh, that person would lose one citizenship. Okay, uh, There were also ten figures known as the sunegaroi, or public advocates. And these prosecuted a magistrate who had failed his othune. And they also prosecuted other public prosecutors who prosecuted those found guilty after an investigation by the assembly or the boule. For example, uh, in, an, uh, in a um, procedure known as the esangalia, which we'll discuss later on, uh, the, the sunegaroi would conduct that. In a previous lecture, I've also mentioned the Eleven, who are a kind of special police force that are rather mysterious to us, and who also were in charge of the prison in Athens. We don't know what the prerequisite was for being a member of the Eleven. Uh, I would imagine it required be having a strong build <laughs> and, uh, you know, willingness to bust heads or something like that. But... Um, you know, uh, we don't really know too much about it. Now, since Athens was one of the largest polis in the classical period, it had literally hundreds of magistrates and officials to administer it. It also had a large number of courts. And that actually brings us to discuss the courts uh, now at this point in our opening salvo in the lecture. We've already said a lot about the courts in our survey of the development of the legal code. But they were another part of the judicial machinery, and we now need to make some comments uh, on them here and now in their own right. For the archaic and early classical periods, the Areopagus was responsible with the archons for dispensing justice. But after the legislation of Ephialtes in 462, we recall that was the time when Athens then entered into its radical democracy, its direct democracy. Um, part of that legislation of Ephialtes in 462 rendered the Areopagus largely impotent, apart from certain judicial functions uh, that we've mentioned before. These judicial functions uh, were the right to judge cases of premeditated homicide, wounding, arson, uh, attempted tyranny or subversion of the Constitution, and kind of, uh, most oddly for us, damaging the sacred olive trees of Athens, but it shows you how, how seriously they took that. Everything else, all the other, everything that was a crime that was not one of those things, uh, including the right to judge an official's conduct during, office, during his time in office, the Othune, all of that fell to the courts, the ecclesia, the assembly, or the boule. The religious nature of homicide made it an especially heinous crime because it created miasma, pollution, this kind of spiritual virus that, that went around and infected the whole community. And this would, um, if this miasma were not expiated, if, were, if it were, if a homicide were not resolved by the city in, in the proper ritualistic way, then the city could be complete, uh, totally polluted. And that could bring all sorts of terrible things like famine, plague, you know, earthquakes, uh, the destruction of one form or another. Uh, if you have read Sophocles' Oedipus Rex, you know that the opening section of the play is uh, takes place where there is a terrible plague sweeping through the city of Thebes, and they come to their king, Oedipus, and they say, you know, please, you have to do something about this, and he goes and he goes to the Oracle of Delphi, sends a messenger there, and who comes back and says, the reason why uh, you've, uh, you've, and then of course he consults the prophet Tiresias, asks him, you know, what is this plague that is, you know, why is this happening to Thebes? And he says it is because the murder of the old king is within our walls, and that is what is producing this, uh, this terrible miasma. Okay, so that that's the sort of thing that's the, you know, that that's the reason why homicide had to be dealt with in just the right way. It was necessary to lift this miasma as quickly and expeditiously as possible without causing further pollution. And so the type of homicide uh, that took place 
the different kinds of qualities to it, spawned a number of different courts. And that is why there were actually five special courts set up to try the different types of homicides that exist. Um, and in all of these courts, apart from the Areopagus, the jurors would number 51. Um, of course, the one is there to make sure there was there would never be a tie vote. Uh, but that's, a, that's actually a relatively small number compared to what some of the other jury numbers could be, which could get into the uh, over, well, 1,500. Um, and I'd just like to say a few words now about these five different courts that were set up, all with the intention of trying different types of homicide um, and to see how they differed from amongst, uh, amongst themselves. To begin with, there was the Areopagus, something of an old friend to us by now. And as I've said, the Areopagus tried cases of premeditated homicide. And all of its members would judge these cases. Okay, so um, it is interesting. The, the ancient Greeks did not develop as complicated a system of casuistry that we take for granted in modern day law. Uh, casuistry is kind of basically, to put it simply, uh, what was going through the mind of the of the criminal during the action of the crime. And so we do make a, a lot of distinctions in our modern day law law courts about you know did the person mean to do it did they plan it ahead of time was it an act of passion in the moment was it an accident altogether you know um you know did it involve a car did it, you know they were all, all you know there's all these different gradations of first degree murder second degree murder you know manslaughter vehicular manslaughter and so on um so the Athenians don't have anything quite as complicated as that, but they're, in some ways they, they kind of presage that sort of way of thinking about things. So the Areopagus would take care of premeditated homicide. The second court was called the Palladion, which unfortunately this is the best picture I could find uh, for you, but it has been more or less recently discovered where it was in Athens. This tried cases of unintentional homicide uh, or even planning a homicide, but not, not carrying it out. Uh, we attempted murder, we might say. Um, and it also, also killing a medic, that is a resident alien or a foreigner or also even a slave. Um, these would all be tried at the Palladion. Then there was a third court. This was called the Delphinion, which tried cases of justified homicide. Now, in Athenian law, justified homicide involves someone who killed another in self-defense or killed a competitor at the Olympic Games. For instance, there was a rather horrendous uh, contest called the Pancration at the Olympic Games, which was boxing and wrestling combined. Um, and the only rules basically were that you shouldn't kill your opponent. And I think also something about uh, not allowing eye gouging, <laughs> but everything else basically, you know, you could basically do it. So if you, if a person happened to kill, there, there were no rounds, there was no breaks, there was no kind of timeout or like that. Everything else was allowed. So if a person did wind up dying inside of that, it's hard to imagine that was not an uncommon thing, actually. Um, then they would be tried here at the Delphinion. Also under the justified homicide law was the killing of an adulterer, a husband who caught his wife in flagrante delecto uh, and killed the adul adulterer, um, could do so with impunity. Okay, he would be tried and there had to be, you know, they had to get all the details out. Did he know the person ahead of time? Does he, was he kind of using this as an excuse or was it really just a kind of, uh, you know, uh, was an actual just catching her wife, uh, catching his wife in that kind of act and therefore not having any premeditation. If there was any premeditation, then it was not justified. Um, he had to catch the adulterer in the act. And again, we actually, believe it or not, have a speech that has come down. Uh, it is called Against Eratosthenes. Um, and uh, it is by the, the author Lysias, which is a speech in, in the person of, of the defendant who to tells all about how he caught his wife in this act and killed the man who, uh, who was doing it. Um, justifiable, hom justifiable homicide, just to finish with this court, the, Del the Delphinion, um, this also covered anyone who killed a person trying to subvert the Constitution. So if somebody was trying to, um, you know, destroy the democracy and make themselves a tyrant or some other kind of oligarchical figure, then that could also be tried here. Um, the fourth court that judged cases of murder um, was the Pritineon. This has happened when a suit was brought to the Pritineon. The, uh, the, the unidentified uh, 
uh, murderer would simply be referred to as the doer of the deed. So the only bit cases that could come here would be when a person, when they didn't actually know who it was that had committed the murder. Um, that sounds strange. How could you try a person? Well, the Britannian, uh, could you could judge somebody in absentia, therefore, and so if they ever did catch the person, they would they would be within their the city would would be within their rights to punish that person. And uh, very oddly, by our standards, the the Britannian also judged cases when an animal or an object even had caused the death of a person. So, for instance, if a rock fell down on someone and killed that person, or if a horse bolted and ran over someone. Um, Today, a case like this would be probably handled by, you know, a tort law or something like that. But back then, because someone had been killed in a violent manner, the gods were involved, there was miasma. And so the case had to be judged and there had to be certain ritualistic things done to expiate that murder. The fifth and final court was the in the sanctuary of the Freatos, and this dealt with someone who was currently living in exile because he had been found guilty of homicide before, but while living in exile, he had killed somebody, another person he had killed again. Perhaps he had killed an Athenian who was living abroad, or he killed an Athenian trader uh, who was operating in some other polis or state or something like that. Um, and the murderer was now accused of a second killing. That's the point. This person could defend himself against the new homicide charge, but he had to make his defense not in the actual sanctuary, because that would be bringing miasma into a sanctuary, no good. Um, he had to do it actually on a boat that was anchored off the coast uh, at Freato, which is the sanctuary. This is dedicated to this um, quasi-mythical mythical hero named Freato. Um, the defendant put forward his case from the boat so he didn't need to send, set foot on Attic soil and therefore pollute it. Um, and, you know, because obviously being convicted of murder before and now being in exile, he had definitely already been polluted and so he would only be polluting the city if he... Uh, that was one of the ways you could kind of get miasma out was by exiling the murderer. Once trial by jury became the norm in Athens, all of the law courts became an important part of the Athenian constitution. They met regularly for over two thirds of the year and each year a panel of 6,000 citizens was elected to the jury board and swore an oath to uphold the laws uh, as we've talked about before. And what is interesting about the courts is that their location supposedly in the Agora of Athens is actually still unknown. There doesn't seem to have been a fixed building made of stone, which was the law court, like there is today. You know, we can walk around and say this is the Supreme Court or this is the municipal court or whatever. Uh, very often in Athens, cases were simply heard in other buildings, like the Odeon, which is a kind of um, concert hall or something like that, um, that one can visit in Athens there. Uh, it's built close to the Acropolis and was built there during the time of Pericles. These other buildings would be used as a suggested for a variety of functions, not just like, uh, you know, we might have a sports stadium or something like that used for both sporting events and also then converted into like a political rally or something like that. That's basically what these big buildings were used like for in Athens. They had multi-purposes. There's also belief that the courts might have been portable structures in the sense that it could have been erected and dismantled depending on the case, kind of like these big tents or something. Uh, for some cases, we get very large juries, as I suggested a moment ago. They can number in the four figures, and the lowest one was actually 201. So clearly, if you have a building with a fixed number of seats, uh, then that building could accommodate that number. But if you were able to put together a, a number of movable seats, like bleachers today, and put these together in a big kind of tent or something like that, some maybe some open-air structure, who knows, then that would solve the problem, really, when you had a jury of a larger number. Well, as we've talked about before, the jurors took their role seriously in the Constitution, even though the pay was measly. It had been increased by Cleon in 424 to three obols a day. That was half a drachma. And to just give you some perspective on that, uh, you know, dollar amounts would make no sense at all. So to give you an idea of how much three obols a day or half a drachma a day was, an unskilled laborer at this time, uh, would make one drachma a day. So it's half the wages of an unskilled laborer. Um, he, would, he would make twice as much as a juror would. 
Moreover, jury pay remained at this rate, three obols a day, even until the late 4th century, so 100 years after Cleon raised it. But by contrast, uh, by the late 4th century, assembly pay, that is paid to attend the ecclesia, was three times greater. Uh, uh, it was one and a half drachmas per day. And this different rate of pay has implications, I believe, for how the Athenians viewed their participation in civic life, and by extension, I think, what they wanted to do in the state. Um, now, we can look at it in two ways. Did higher pay for the assembly indicate that the assembly was a more important organ of the constitution? Um, it did deliver, debate and decide all domestic and foreign policy, after all. And so as a result, the people deserved a higher rate of pay for attending it. And that might make perfect sense, but then you can look at it from the exact opposite direction and say perhaps the higher rate of pay for the assembly was to induce Athenians to attend the assembly, perhaps because they didn't always want to do so. Maybe there wasn't always a quorum. Maybe it was the le the lesser popular option compared to uh, the law courts. There always seems to have been a long line of men for the law courts. Um, remember Aristophanes' uh, jury mania uh, that we talked about in our previous lecture. Um, so by those lights, there was no need to raise the jury pay because there was never any shortage of men wanting to do the job. So you can look at it really in two ways. It's a matter of, matter of how you interpret the evidence. We know that in the 5th century BC, a man carrying a rope dipped in vermilion dye, that is red dye, would go into the agora, the marketplace, and would twirl his rope around. And whoever got hit by it would get a red mark on him. And those men who got those red marks would then have to go up to the Pnyx, that is the place where the ecclesia met. OK, um, this was their way of kind of uh, getting people to go to the assembly. And that indicates that the people, I think, were less thrilled at attending an assembly meeting than they were at being jurors. And as a result, they had to be coaxed to the assembly with greater pay. That's the way I interpret that evidence. Well, the final part of the judicial machinery that I just want to discuss in this opening salvo here are the arbitrators. These people were extremely important in the Constitution. We've already talked about the role of arbitrators in early Greek law when two parties couldn't reconcile their differences and they would approach either a king or a tribal elder, that is not a third party, to settle the dispute. And this was handled fairly informally. Arbitration was a much used part of the judicial machinery and part of the process of law in the classical period. It was probably a means to reduce the workload of the courts. In other words, to stop them getting bogged down in all manner of cases, because uh, particularly in the 4th century BC, litigation increased so dramatically, something like, you know, the way it is now in America, where, you know, people are sue each other at the drop of a hat. So, you know, the, the, the law courts are backed up. By the classical period, arbitration had become a formal process and it was governed by law. There were both private and public arbitrators, and the public ones were appointed by the state. Public arbitration was seen as a civic duty, and all males in their 60th year, that is, age 59 and up, were required by law to serve as arbitrators. And therefore, it, just as it was expected that ordinary citizen males would attend the assemblies or be a juror, so the same citizens were expected to serve as public arbitrators when they became old enough. And in actual fact, expected is the wrong word here. An Athenian citizen need not necessarily attend the assembly to be uh, or, or be a juror. These would uh, be the passive citizens who didn't take part in political life. But notice that under Athenian law, by the age of 59, you had to be a public arbitrator. So there's no wriggling out of that one, except in special circumstances that I'll actually talk about in a second. There are significant differences between private and public arbitration. In a private arbitration, both sides had to agree as to who the arbitrator was going to be. Both sides had to state what the dispute was about and that they would accept the arbitrator's verdict. And the arbitrator had to accept and swear that he would arbitrate in a fair and just manner. This was something akin to the juror's oath that we looked at last week. Probably settling on an arbitrator who was agreeable to both parties was the biggest hurdle. Say you wanted to use one of your friends or a family member who would obviously be biased towards you. Uh, this person would clearly be unacceptable to the other party. 
And that is perhaps why we know that the state sometimes appointed the arbitrators. Presumably, they were going to impart, I'm sorry, they were going to appoint impartial men who had no connections with either of the disputants. In a private arbitration, the theory was that both parties accepted the arbitrator's verdict because both had agreed in advance on who the person was going to be. However, if after a public arbitration, one of the disputants didn't accept the verdict, he had the right to appeal it. If he chose uh, to do this, he had recourse to several avenues. First of all, he could accuse the arbitrator of bias against him. This involves summoning a meeting of all the arbitrators appointed for that year and bringing a charge known as es angelia uh, against the arbitrator in question. The word es angelia is a procedure that's normally translated in the Penguin translations, for instance, uh, uh, as uh, of of the legal speeches, uh, as impeachment. Uh, This is the word that is used there. If the board of arbitrators decided that the arbitrator had been corrupt, then the penalty was atimia, that is, he was stripped of all citizenship rights. And when this happened, the accused arbitrator did have the right of appeal himself, but obviously since he could suffer the loss of citizenship rights, uh, it was very much in his favor to avoid bias and not have to get let things get that far. A second alternative was for someone who felt aggrieved to apply for the case to go to a formal law court. And when that happened, the evidence from the arbitration was sealed until the trial. It would be sealed inside of two urns, one for the prosecution and one for the defense. What is more, only the evidence from the arbitration could be used in the trial. Nothing extra could be introduced after the original arbitration. The arbitration itself took place in a public place where anyone could go along and listen. Both sides put forward their cases and the arbitrator tried to get both parties to agree to a compromise while uh, the hearing took place. If he couldn't do this for some reason, then he fixed a day when he could make his decision, and on that day he gave his verdict. Some arbitrators were what we were called tribal judges. Four were elected from each of the ten tribes that had been created by Cleisthenes in 508. And these tribal judges decided private cases brought by members of their tribe. If the amount involved was less than 10 drachmas, the tribal judge settled the matter himself. But if the amount were more than 10 drachmas, then a public arbitrator was brought in. And this public arbitrator would make his decision uh, and report it to the tribal judges. And then in the process, he would take his one drachma of payment. So notice that it is twice as much as the payment for a juryman. Okay. Arbitration, therefore, was seen as a convenient way of settling a dispute out of court, especially for those who might feel intimidated facing a large jury and having to argue a case before it. And this is a very important point. There were no professional lawyers in classical Athens, and individuals had to prepare their cases as well as appear before uh, the court on behalf of themselves. And juries were very large, usually of several hundred citizens at least. And not everyone had the self-confidence, the wherewithal, certainly the legal know-how to appear before such a large audience and make a convincing case. It seems that the vast majority of private disputes never, therefore, made it to a court of law. And therefore, arbitration was meant to reduce the workload of the courts, to stop them from getting bogged down with all sorts of cases, from the most trivial to the most extreme. And as I've said, public arbitration was a civic duty. That is why all citizens in their 60th year had to serve as arbitrators. And they could only get out of serving for that year if they happened to be holding another office at the time or if they were out of the city on business. But apart from uh, the age requirement, the similarity with our jury duty, and especially the reasons we're trying to wriggle out of it are rather obvious, aren't they? Uh, I know I, uh, I've been called up multiple times for jury duty. I always really, really wanted to sit on a jury, but I've always been not selected. I've always been diselected, whatever the term is, when they would do the voir dire. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, they start asking me questions of what I do for a living. I tell them I teach uh, classics, and they say, have you any experience with the law or background in the law? And I say, well, reading Demosthenes and Cicero, of course. And they usually laugh, but then I get deselected from being a juror. I don't know what that's all about. Well, the next part uh, of 
that I'm, that we will take a look at now. After now, we've just kind of given the survey of the the opening part of the machinery of of the legal process. Is that I want to discuss some of the private and public cases and procedures of the legal system. I also want to talk about the preliminaries. Uh, to the trial itself, including witness testimony. And then we're also going to discuss the a group of people that are known in Greek as the sycophants, uh, which is actually not what you think it means. Really, the term should be something more like blackmailers, um, who, oddly enough to us, were part of the judicial process as well. Um, and uh, so it is to that that we will um, uh, we will turn right now. So to begin with, in examining some of the public and private cases and procedures that existed in the developed legal system of Athens, we're going to consider uh, these various different elements that I've just talked about, and then kind of that will take lead us up to what going to trial would actually be like, and that is where we'll end for tonight. Um, but that's still a long way off. Uh, let us begin with the types of cases uh, that one ha one saw in ancient Athens. First of all, the term itself for a case, a private case was called a DK idea, and a public case was called a DK demosia. The former, the DK idea, picks up on this word idios, uh, which actually means one's own. Believe it or not, the word idiot uh, is ultimately related to this word. Idiotis is, is a private citizen, somebody who just does their own thing. And then over time, that kind of meaning somebody who does their own thing is kind of not, not with it, sort of came to mean an idiot um, in our sense of the word. But this is more like the idios root that one sees in certain medical terms, like idiopathic is basically a doctor's way of saying uh, a disease that we don't really understand, like why it's doing what it's doing. It's what, or, you know, the, the cause of it, we don't really understand what the cause of something is. It's idiopathic. It's doing its own thing, really. Um, anyway, so th th this private case, that's what the DK idea means. Um, this uh, uh, idiomatic would, of course, be another one, example of that, by the way. Uh, um, this is for a person as a private individual uh, bringing a lawsuit. The other one, the DK demosia, this word picks up on obviously the word demos, meaning the people or the public, the people as a whole, the community is organized into a political unit. A private case, a DK idea, clearly affected a smaller number, number of disputants and a charge had to be made by one of those affected against someone else. However, a public case affected the state as a whole and any adult male citizen could bring a suit against the alleged criminal. Public cases included, obviously, treason, uh, embezzlement of public funds. Obviously, these, these would affect the running of the city. Um, however, there were crimes that were considered offensive against the people as a whole, that is, against the community, which we might not consider in the same way. And uh, the, the kind of most obvious example would be adultery. And we've talked about this before. The, because the, the Athenians had a very, very profound sense that the family is the building block and the, the basic structure of society. Any crime against the family is in some microcosmic form a crime against the society as a whole. And so adultery was a public crime. It was not a private crime. Um, as were also other things like hubris, which is basically assault and also the maltreating of an orphan. These are all considered to be public crimes because of their ramifications that they can have for the rest of the state. Well, before too long, a private case was identified simply by the word DK, and a public case came to be identified with the word graphe. And this last word, graphe, simply means writing, and perhaps originally uh, it meant the writing up of the charge um, uh, being more serious because it affected the community, uh, you know, therefore, because it was more serious in, the, in that it affected the whole community, it had to be made in writing. That's probably where that term comes from. By the 380s, though, everything was in writing, even the private cases. So <clears throat> that was basically, more, from a legal point of view, that was the time when they went from a change from oral to written testimony in the law courts. And this type of testimony, like depositions and statements of character witness today, uh, was read aloud by some official, some clerk of the court during the actual trial. 
Although cases were generally divided into private DK and public grafe ones, the line between each one was not always clear cut, and some crimes fell into categories that strike us as today rather odd. For example, premeditated homicide was tried under the DK Fonu uh, procedure, a private suit, whereas, as I mentioned just a moment ago, adultery uh, or the passing off of illegitimate children as legitimate Athenians, these were tried under the graphic senias procedure or a public suit. Uh, we actually have a whole case about this that was uh, that is uh, told to us in one of the law uh, one of the legal speeches that has come down to us about a woman named Neara, um, uh, who was not an Athenian citizen who tried to pass her children off as Athenian citizens. That a homicide case was characterized as a DK was perhaps due to tradition. It was a throwback to Dracon's homicide law, which uh, had made, uh, which which was made long before the term graphe writing came into being, and the Athenians probably just simply carried on with that term for the sake of tradition. In a DK case that is a private suit, the wronged party simply brought a suit against the alleged criminal. This could be settled either by the arbitration process, uh, as we've just described earlier, or by a trial if the arbitration process was not acceptable or simply because either side didn't want to use it. The jury in private trials numbered from 201 jurors to 501 jurors, depending on the type of crime uh, or the monetary amount involved. And the penalties varied, again, depending on the crime, especially if money was involved. Usually a fine was the normal penalty. But obviously, in more serious DK cases like homicide, the penalty would be greater. Execution for premeditated homicide, for example, was the standard punishment. A grafe was a much more serious matter because it affected the demos as a whole, the, the state, as we've said. And if a citizen wanted to cha charge a person with a grafe, then he had to use one of several procedures to initiate the case. Uh, and again, the procedure used depended on the nature of the cases. So you're going to get a whole bunch of scary, strange sounding Greek words right now, uh, but we're going to go through each one of them. Each one of these uh, um, cases, we're going to go through each one of these various procedures that existed for initiating a legal case. They are the apagoge, the ephegesis, the endexis, the apagraphe, the fasis, the esangalia, and the provale. Okay, <laughs> I know that's a mouthful, but we'll take them all in turn. In an apagoge, a prosecutor himself arrested the accused person and led him straight off to prison. Here at the prison, the 11, remember that, that group of individuals who were in charge of the jail and the prisoners of it, this kind of police force, would then ensure that the accused did not flee. Uh, as I've said before, the 11 are an enigmatic body. No one really knows exactly when they were introduced or indeed why they were numbered 11. It's not quite right to describe the 11 as a type of police force, uh, although that's the basic, that they did do this job, but they, they had other functions as well in the legal system, including the oversight of prisoners and also handing over condemned men to the executioner. Uh, so they're not just a police force, but that's, you know, that was one of their functions. This procedure, called the apagoge, literally means the leading away, was somewhat similar to the citizen's arrest of today. But what if the, the victim was too intimidated to try to arrest somebody else? Uh, what if they were afraid that person might resist arrest? Well, then that person could resort to the second of these two uh, various procedures for initiating a case, the ephegesis procedure, whereby a prosecutor, the victim, took the appropriate magistrate, to the accused man and had that man arrested by the magistrate. Okay, so that's be the second one. Now, then there's this third one, the indexes procedure. Here in this one, the prosecutor accused someone before the appropriate magistrate, and then the accuser had the option of arresting the defendant himself or, or allowing or having him be arrested by the magistrate. You can see there's not a lot of difference between those two various, those two procedures. They all they're all subtle differences, but you know, uh, the, there's nothing quite like the Greek mind to, to say the very very subtle small differences between things that are very similar to one another. The entire ancient Greek language can kind of be summarized in that way. Um, now to the 
apagrafe and the Fasi's procedures. I'll sort of run these two together because they're so similar. Uh, these were used when someone was accused of still owning property that belonged to the state. In other words, if someone had been found guilty of a, on a previous charge and had to hand over property to the state in the form of a fine, for example, but he had not yet done so, then he could be brought up on charges. And the apagrafe and the fasis uh, were t these two methods that could be used to initiate those charges. If successful, the accuser, the man who brought up the debtor on these charges, um, this man would... Uh, would get 75% of what the uh, man was supposed to have paid under the apocryphal procedure, and he would get 50% of what the man owed under the fastest procedure. It is unclear why one procedure was worth less than the other. Um, and certainly, if you're, if you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound, so why not always go for the apocryphe? Why would you ever go for the, the Fosse's procedure and get only half of the property that, that he owes as a debt? Um, I don't know the answer to that, uh, but it is possible that the type of property that was owed decided the, the matter. We don't really know the details of that, though. If we move over to the second to last, the Esangalia, this was more of a political charge. As I said before, it is usually translated as impeachment and was often brought against officials suspected of corruption. These could be officials elected to regular political offices like the archonships or arbitrators. Um, and as, I, as I noted in the earlier part of this lecture, and the Esangalia procedure was not just aimed at those holding constitutional offices. It was used against people who maltreated orphans as well. And that is, we use the word impeachment, therefore, and we think of that only in, in our modern day times as in its more narrow political sense, like the impeachment of a president. But the Athenians did not have this narrow political sense of the word. Um, and therefore, another translation of the Esangalia that you sometimes see in, in translations uh, is the word denunciation. And this may convey the meaning a little bit more clearly, I think, than impeachment. Our final procedure here is the probole. A probole was a case that was first heard in the assembly. And then if the assembly, the ecclesia, thought that the charge was justified, it referred the case to a law court. In other words, the probole was like a preliminary verdict that was decided by the assembly. It was preliminary in the sense that it wasn't the final one that was issued, uh, that would be issued only by the court if the case got that far. There's actually a very famous case dating from the year 348 BC when Demosthenes, the orator, was punched in the face by a man named Medius at a religious festival. There it is again. Um, under Athenian law, this conduct at a religious gathering was illegal. It could have offended the gods, created miasma. Um, so Demosthenes brought a probole against Medius, and we have Demosthenes's ultra lengthy prosecution speech um, uh, from that trial, and it is it is one of the uh, relatively few. Um, forensic speeches that have survived from Athens. We have a lot of them. We don't have a huge amount, though. There would have been, obviously, you know, tens of thousands of speeches that would have been, you know, given in Athens during its democracy. But uh, we have maybe, you know, a couple of dozen of them, you know, well, less than 100, that's for sure. Um, now that we've summarized some of the judicial procedures by which a person might be accused, let us now turn to the litigants. As we know, it was up to a private individual to bring a suit against someone and for those individuals to speak on their behalf in court if they got that far. The prosecutor might be the wrong person himself or under Solon's law of third party intervention, he might be a volunteer prosecutor. In other words, a person who accused someone on behalf of the victim. There were occasions when a person could not indict someone during the year and certain cases couldn't be started except at specific times. Uh, and these would include homicide suits. And I'll expand on this point right now, actually. You see, today, someone can be accused of murder at any time. <laughs> but in classical Athens, a homicide case could only be brought in the first seven months of the year. Okay, now you remember that the Attic year lasted for 10 months. Okay, each month was roughly six weeks long, therefore. Um, 
Why could you only prosecute someone for homicide in the first seven months of the year and not the remaining three? Well, this was because the whole suit, from its inception to the actual trial, could take up to four months. What with evidence, witness testimony, finding out all sorts of things. This was a capital charge. Of course, there would be an investigation. And homicide was obviously a very serious crime involving capital punishment. And therefore, it was thought that the same magistrate who oversaw the start of the homicide case should see it through to the end. And because that magistrate was only elected for one year, he would be unable to do this if the procedure started during those last three months of his office. Once the attic year came to an end, a new magistrate would take over. Uh, we know so little about law elsewhere. It is often frustrating. We don't know how, if this was the standard across Greece. Uh, however, we do know that in Sparta, capital cases took several days to be decided because the decision to condemn, once it had been carried out, could not be reversed as in non-capital cases. The Athenians evidently thought about this as well, and they realized the implications of finding somebody guilty on a capital charge and executing that person. You can bring someone back from exile, but you can't bring them back from the dead. So uh, the same person who brought the indictment to the magistrate on the right day also had to ensure that the accused person would turn up on the same day. If the crime was a public one and he was game enough to go for the apagoge, that is to arrest the man himself, then the accuser issued an oral summons to the person, something along the lines of, I summon you to appear before a magistrate, you know, such and such on this particular day. And he would be accompanied by at least two people as witnesses. That way the accused couldn't say, I didn't know. Uh, but uh, when the day for the first hearing arrived, the person bringing the charge made a statement of his claim to the magistrate which from the year 380 onward was in writing, and he paid a fee to initiate the proceedings. We discussed the judicial power of the magistrates um, at the earlier part of this lecture tonight, from the archons to the state-appointed Sunegoroi, um, and how some of these were akin to public prosecutors as we might think of them today. Included among these prosecutors was another group, though, that I did not talk about earlier and that is better dealt with right now, and that was the sycophants. Okay. Now, in a nutshell, these were blackmailers. These were men who would spy on others and then threaten to take them to court unless they paid them off. Sycophant obviously has a very different meaning today. When we think of the word sycophant, we think of a flatterer, a toady, somebody who's kind of always like, you know, kissing up to somebody else, maybe to get some, you know, free stuff out of them or somehow, you know, manipulate them. Um, but back then, uh, it meant something totally different. Some crimes and procedures obviously appealed to sycophants, to these blackmailers, such as the apagoge. Um, a procedure by which the accuser got 75% of the convicted man's property, or the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the apagrafe, not the apagrafe, the apagrafe, or the fasces, which, in, in, under which the uh, accuser got 50% of the man's property. The sycophants as a whole probably arose out of Solon's volunteer prosecutors, in other words, those third-party interventions. And they became notorious as the 5th century BC wore on, and especially in the 4th century. It seems that many sycophants prosecuted just for the sake of it, even if the misdeed wasn't that great. You know, so if we were to put it into our own modern day times, you know, we can all, uh, you know, we, we've all committed crimes uh, throughout our lives with probably, perhaps not even, you know, thinking anything of it. You know, every time you, you know, roll through a stop sign without coming to a complete stop. That's, of course, in a violation of a law. And certainly, I'm sure we've done uh, done worse things than that. So um, in Athens, if you were spotted during this, if a sycophant was kind of looking after you, to, you know, trying to catch you up in something, uh, and you had a lot of money, um, then it was worth a shot. It didn't really ma how, matter how minor the crime was or conceivably how major. Needless to say, sycophancy was scorned by members of society, and that was probably why a man could be prosecuted for being a sycophant under the proboloi procedure, that is, for kind of being a professional a prosecutor of, of other people's misdeeds, kind of going around and, uh, you know, initiating these procedures just simply for a profit. It wasn't actually legal to do so. And that is the, this, this proboloi procedure was the one where the assembly first delivers a preliminary verdict, and then if it thinks the case has merit, it proceeds to a law court. Uh, 
I think sycophants were prosecuted under the proboloi because of the involvement of the assembly, the ecclesia. The sycophant would become the talk of the town because several thousand people in the assembly and not just a few hundred jurors in law court would all know who he was. And it would have uh, been felt, I think, that having the ecclesia, the assembly, investigate a charge of sycophancy would be a deterrent to stop a sycophant's um, extortionate activities in the future. Everybody would know his name, and, you know, it would be like, I don't know, having a shameful reputation when somebody Googles your name or something like that, you know. Uh, you know, your reputation is ruined for life. Another effort to curb the practices of sycophants, which might overburden courts, is if someone called a sycophant's bluff and didn't want to pay him off, was the law that if a prosecutor failed to obtain one-fifth of the votes cast in the trial, at least, or if he abandoned the case after he started it, then he himself would be fined 1,000 drachmas. This is a very substantial sum. Uh, remember, I told you before that one drachma uh, was the um, uh, was the, the, the wage for an, uh, an unskilled laborer for a day. So this is a thousand days of, for an unskilled laborer. So we're you know talking about multiple years of you know a, for for an unskilled laborer. That, but that would be the fine. So that's a very substantial sum of money, and it was clearly meant to act as a deterrent. Anyone bringing an esengalia was not subject to this law, however. Later, the inability to bring the type of case the prosecutor had abandoned or lost by more than four fifths of the vote cast was added to the penalty and the unsuccessful prosecutor might suffer atimia that is the, the stripping of citizenship rights this would surely put sycophants off from going after anyone willy-nilly if they face such dire consequences at least that's what we would think at the same time though it is to be noted that the athenians could have imposed far more severe penalties on sycophancy and that they didn't makes one wonder whether or not they were tacitly viewing sycophancy as a necessary evil to check the activities of potential lawbreakers. After all, uh, there was no real police force. Yes, you had the 11, but 11 people in a city-state of, you know, tens of thousands is not going to be that effective of watching everybody. Um, and if someone were planning to break the law and was found out, or if someone had committed a crime and was being blackmailed for it. And that meant the courts wouldn't be involved. Um, it would free up the court time for other trials. So presumably the sycophants kept tabs on those that they had successfully caught before. So a person who had been a sycophant's victim in the past was, I think, therefore unlikely to do anything criminal again for fear of further blackmail. This would have a salubrious effect on the crime rate, one would think. So regardless of the scorn heaped on them, the sycophants were perhaps a necessary evil, and they were, I think, recognized as that. Now, as we've already said, the victim could accuse someone of a, uh, by a DK uh, if a private matter uh, was, the, was the thing in question, or by one of several procedures if the matter was a public one. Some of these procedures involved a magistrate from the outset, like the phagesis, and others involved just the person bringing the charge, the apagoge. The accuser had to make his case to the relevant magistrate, and if the magistrate decided that the right legal procedure was being followed in the indictment, and that any witness testimony was acceptable, he would then set a date for a more formal hearing called an anachrisis, or a preliminary inquiry. This was held in the open air, and anyone could observe it. So there was plenty of people around to witness, to act as witnesses if one of the disputants tried to wriggle out of something later on. Again, we can compare this to the uh, open air hearing between the two disputants on the shield of Achilles in Book 18 of Homer's Iliad. At the anachrisis, the charge would be read out, and the accuser and the accused would be er interrogated by the magistrate only after that did the magistrate decide whether the case had merits and that it should proceed to a law court or perhaps arbitration in the case of a private matter. If the case was proceeding to a court, then all the evidence that had been brought out at the anachrisis was sealed into urns, and these would not be open until the trial proper. 
And as with arbitration that went to a law court, if someone disputed it, no additional evidence could be introduced after the anachoresis. It was during the anachoresis that the person accused would, could challenge his accuser if he thought he was being prosecuted under the wrong law. And given the multitude of laws and procedures, it was entirely possible that someone might accuse another person under the wrong procedure, either by accident or design. It was then up to the magistrate to decide whether the prosecutor was going about it the right way. But the big question was, what happened if the magistrate didn't know the law well enough? Well, a way to help the magistrate decide the best procedure, which was the fairest, which was the right one, was by the use of witnesses. And the use of witnesses was in a procedure called the diamateria. And it was introduced in the 5th century BC. A witness who claimed to know the facts of the case or about either of the, the two disputants made a formal statement under oath and then the magistrate used that statement to decide whether the case should proceed and under what procedure. The big question here, of course, is what if the witness lied? Well, as it turned to this, the other party could bring a DK against the witness under a procedure called the pseudo martyrion. Uh, pseudo in the or pseudo is of course the Greek word for false. Pseudo martyrion uh, translates as giving false witness. You notice, by the way, that the word martyr. Uh, is the word for witness. That is actually where the, the Christian word martyr comes from. But originally it was a classical word, meaning just witness in a law court. Um, obviously in Christianity, a martyr, somebody who dies giving witness to the truth of, of the Christian faith, uh, the witness to the resurrection of Christ, this is what the word martyr means in the Christian sense. Um, but it does come from this classical meaning of, of a legal term, a witness. Well, the case would then go, if, if, if the charge was uh, to, of the DK Soda Marturion was to be brought, the case would then go to a law court, and if found guilty, the witness or witnesses suffered atimia, the loss of citizenship rights. So lying was clearly a gamble that you could lose and lose big on. While the Dia Marturia was being decided by a court, the original case was put on hold. Uh, and when the Dia Martyria had been settled, the original case continued. But of course, if your witness or witnesses had been found guilty of giving false testimony, that would have a, certainly a detrimental effect on the validity of your case, I would say. By the end of the 5th century, the Dia Martyria was replaced by the Paragrafe procedure. As a result of the paragraph, Paragrafe uh, procedure. At the initial hearing, the accused man who thought that his prosecutor was charging him falsely or charging him under the wrong procedure brought a suit against the prosecutor. Uh, and when that happened, once again, the original case was put on hold while the paragrafe was decided by a court. Of course, what's happened now is that the defendant in the original case became the prosecutor in the paragrafe or the new case uh, that was now being brought since he was indicting the original prosecutor. If he won his paragrafe, the original prosecutor had his case dismissed and he lost one-sixth of his property. We can imagine that the process of private individuals prosecuting someone or defending themselves would have been intimidating for many people, given the hundreds that could make up a jury. And presumably, if people were intimidated about talking before their peers in an assembly, they would be also intimidated in a law court. We should also question how much the ordinary person knew about the points of law. If a person going to an assembly could not expertly evaluate whether it was a good idea to send most of Athens's fleet to Sicily, as we learned about during our lectures on the Peloponnesian War, then that same person likely was not going to know much about the ins and outs of law. And as I said before, men of the fourth century especially were fairly knowledgeable about current events, and there was a lot of street talk in Athens. But talking about current events is very different from knowing about the finer points of law, and that is why we see in the 4th century the rise of a group of people known as the logographoi, or professional speechwriters. These men, for a fee, of course, would write the prosecution or the defense speech. Uh, 
The Lagago Rafoy probably also had expertise in law, so that when a private individual consulted a Lagago Rafos, that's the singular, to write a speech for a particular case, that Lagago Rafos could also advise on matters of law. So long as the person had the money, he might not need to prepare his own case. He might be able to leave it to a Lagago Rafos to do this for him. The litigants could also call on supporting speakers, that would be the Sunegoroi, uh, to speak on their behalf in court. Such people would routinely be family members or friends. This recourse, <clears throat> in other words, being able to call on supporting speakers, would be especially helpful if the main speaker uh, was not himself a great speaker. Um, <clears throat> That is, if the prosecutor or defendant were not a great speaker, if he was a bit intimidated or something. After all, everything depended on convincing the jury. And that is a point that I will pick up on in, in the last part of our lecture momentarily. But performance mattered as much as content. And that's a really major difference between our law courts nowadays and the ancient world. Uh and incidentally, note that the same term sunegoroi was used for the public prosecutors that I just talked about recently. So it's the context that determined whether the person was a character witness of a prosecutor or whether he's a public prosecutor appointed by the state. Logography was probably a steady and lucrative business, given that Athens was a litigious society. However, the logographos had to be good. Otherwise, no one would hire him if his speeches kept losing cases. And now, uh, I would just like to suggest to you that, as far as I see it, I see in the formal class of logographoi, who charged fees for their legal and writing expertise, and then in the more informal group of the sunegoroi who spoke on one's behalf, I see the modern or the origins of our modern lawyer. That is someone who, for a fee and a big fee usually, <laughs> prepares a case from start to finish, and speaks uh, on behalf of his clients uh, uh, in, in court. And if successful, he can build up a large and powerful law firm and perhaps even attract media attention if the case com comes along right. Uh, the same was true in Athens, except there was no law firms as such, certainly. But there were a number of high-profile trials, and many logographoi would have shot to fame and fortune because of them. Some also used their reputation as speechwriters to enter into the world of, of politics, and such a man was Demosthenes, who we're actually going to be learning about a lot in the final lectures of our course. But now that we've set up all of that, we've seen the procedures, we've seen the types of cases, and we've seen the different players that are involved in it, what I would like to do right now is take you to trial in Athens, uh, and really try to answer the questions of what exactly happened when a case went to trial in ancient Athens? What was required on the part of the litigants? What sorts of arguments were used to sway the jury? Um, and uh, how did the jury vote? How long did a trial last? What are some of the striking differences between classical trials and those of today? These are all the questions that I'd like to take up now, and I'm going to build this final portion of the lecture around them. A number of trials would be heard on the days when the courts met, which were about two-thirds or so of the year. The jurors would not know in advance which trial they were hearing until they were assigned to an actual court. The jurors <clears throat> to be arrived in the court complexes very early in the morning, around daybreak, and they underwent a multi-stage selection process. Included in this process were tokens or markers that had the name of a different juror on each of them. <clears throat> And they were put into an allotment machine called a cleroterion. And here you see on the right an actual ancient bit of one that has been unearthed by archaeologists. And on the left, you see a kind of modern recreation of what they would have looked like. Um, and to these, the tokens with their names in them were arbitrarily selected from this machine so that no one knew each jur which juror's name would come out and which would not. Um, it's a bit like drawing numbers from like one of those lottery machines nowadays. The process must have taken some time. And those men who were not selected for, the, for duty for that day simply went home and they tried again another day. Assigned to their courts now, the jurors would sit through some administrative proceedings, such as selecting one person to be in charge of the water clock 
uh, that is the Klepsidra event uh, you see in front of you. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, this measured the length of the speeches. They also selected four persons who were responsible for the ballot urns into which uh, the jurors cast their votes, and they probably also finalized details to do with their payment at the end of the trial day. When all these sorts of things were over and done with, the trial proper began. The trial was divided into three stages, and the term usually applied to the whole process is the tripartite day, or the measured out day. This is the word that's used um, in ancient Greek, the hemera metra. Um, it, this is a term that refers to the water that, that timed court speeches and was measured quite literally by the water clock. The first third of the day was given over to the prosecution's case, and the second third of the day was the defense case. And then if the defendant was found guilty, in many cases he could propose an alternative penalty. And the third portion of the day was given over to speeches about that penalty. The speakers had the same amount of time, and this was strictly controlled by this water clock. Uh, just to give you an idea of what we're looking at here, there's different types of them that archaeologists have found, but the one on the left here you can see it consists of two different urns holding a certain amount of water. Each urn had a hole in the bottom, so when you when all the water from one, you let go of the plug and all the water from one would go into the other, that would be times up. Uh, there's another one that you can see on the right here. There's different like measures. So once the water goes down to those different levels, you know, uh, and it goes into the basin and the bottom, that you know, you can stop them anywhere along the way there. Um, now, uh, because of water clocks that have been discovered in the Agora in Athens, when we see how long it took to empty these things and to compare them to the number of urns that we hear about in some forensic speeches, scholars who have spent a lot of time on this sort of thing have made a best guess estimate that a public trial, uh, and remember that there was only one public trial per day, a public trial, uh, the trial day itself would last for six hours and 36 minutes. And therefore, each of the thirds of that, can't fool me, a third of six hours and 36 minutes is two hours and 12 minutes. And so that's what we're dealing with here. And the water clock would not, would not be stopped for the quoting of supporting evidence, such as laws or oracles or decrees in public trials. The water clock was only stopped in private suits when evidence was quoted. And this meant that in a public suit, you really had to time your speech very closely, especially if you wanted to include all sorts of supporting evidence. And we have a number of forensic speeches with references uh, in them to lines like, gentlemen of the jury, I could tell you more, but I see that the water is against me. Or at the end of a speech, there is a reference to handing over the water to the other prosecutor. Uh, these are all references to the klepsudra and the amount of time available or not available, as the case may be. The jurors voted at the end of the defense speech, so the second third of the day is when they would vote. Um, each juror was given one bronze disc with a solid axle through the center and one bronze disc with a hollow axle through the center. The sol solid axle was to quit the defendant and the hollow axle was to convict him. The jurors cast one of these ballots, uh, the one that they wanted to be counted into a bronze urn, and they discarded the other ballot that they didn't want to have counted, apparently, into a wooden urn. The idea, I think, would be that they would keep their thumb and forefinger over the ends of the axles so that the guy next to them wouldn't be able to see how they were voting. You know, you kept your finger, your thumb and forefinger over each end of the axle. Nobody knows whether it's hollow or solid. And the ballots in the bronze urn were then emptied out into a board and were counted, and the defendant was either acquitted or accused found guilty, uh, that is, um, uh, depending on the number of solid or hollow axled uh, ballots that had been cast. If the jurors declared the defendant innocent, they drew their pay and went home. If it was the end of the day, they would then listen to another private suit, uh, remember only one public suit, but you could have other private suits, um, uh, as did the defendant, but if they found the defendant guilty and there was the option of a speech to suggest an alternative penalty, the jurors returned to their seats. And the document uh, known as the Athenian Constitution tells us that 
they stood to cast their votes. So presumably they stayed standing while the ballots were counted. Otherwise, they would have had to return to their seats and then gotten up again. If the defendant were acquitted, it would have been a big hullabaloo. Once they were settled again, the jurors sat through the final third of the tripartite day to hear speeches about the penalty. Both the prosecutor and the defendant put forward alternate penalties. If a guilty party was going to be punished for, by exile, for example, he might try to commute his sentence somewhat by asking to return after a certain number of years, or perhaps asking that his property not be confiscated by the state, but that his family might retain control of it. Of course, the most famous alternative penalty is perhaps that of Socrates in the year 399. Socrates, as we all know, was put up on trial in that year on trumped-up charges of impiety and corrupting the youth. I've mentioned this case many times. The charges, although they were concocted, were serious ones, and he was found guilty and sentenced to death. And the jurors at his trial knew that it was a political one, and so Socrates knew it too. And uh, in a previous lecture, I talked about uh, the Crito dialogue of Plato, where Crito visits Socrates in prison on the eve of his execution and urges Socrates to escape. He would be safe elsewhere, says Crito. And the Athenians would have breathed a sigh of relief to get him out of Athens, because that's all they wanted to do to get rid of him. But Socrates refused, and he drank the hemlock the next day and died. Since everyone at the trial knew Socrates was a victim, really, of political charges, the jurors would probably have been prepared to adopt a lesser penalty, such as Socrates proposed uh, that he... Um, such as perhaps saying that, you know, Socrates be moved into a self-imposed exile, that he leave a Attica. But Socrates, of course, refused to do that famously. He said, I'll never stop philosophizing, even if I have to die many times. And instead of proposing a more suitable counter penalty, a scornful and defiant Socrates stood up before the jury and proposed that instead of being executed, he should be fed at state expense for the rest of his life in the prison now. Uh, which was actually the greatest civic honor that was only given usually to Olympic uh, athletes and stuff who had won first place. So this, of course, was an insult <laughs> to the Athenians, and it was rejected. And so therefore he drank the hemlock and died. Where the law formally prescribed a penalty, the defendant could not propose an alternative one. Premeditated homicide, for example, carried the death penalty. No ifs, ands, or buts. No wriggling out of that one. Those sentenced to death faced execution by one of three ways. There was a pit into which the condemned man could be thrown, either to die from the fall or from starvation after being left there. There was a second punishment, which was uh, the guilty person would be shackled by iron rings around his necks, neck, wrists, and ankles, and he was left out to die from exposure, nailed to a, or no, chained to a board, or the iron collar around his neck would gradually kind of strangle him. And finally, there was the drinking of hemlock, uh, which Socrates chose. Exile was another penalty for major crimes, and those who were punished with death or exile also had their property confiscated by the state. Sometimes even their families and descendants were disenfranchised. Um, and that was what I meant when I said that, that someone exiled, sentenced to exile might plead that his property not be confiscated. He might plead that his family be allowed to continue to live in the house or retain ownership of it or something of that nature. The Athenian constitution tells us that trials were over and done with in a day. In fact, it says that four private cases were heard by one court and one public case was heard by another. That made the procedure very rushed, as I've already suggested especially given time limits that included the quoting of evidence. This is very different from today, of course, when we have trials that stretch out for months or even years in uh, you know, very large public cases. Also, normally when the defendant is guilty, the punishment is carried out the next... Uh, the, when the defendant was guilty in ancient Athens, the punishment would be carried out the next day, and this included execution. Uh, there's no such thing in classical Athens as, a, as, as death row, you know, where people sit there for years. There was no filing for multiple stays of execution or appeals to have death sentences com commuted on grounds that the method was cruel or unusual, or unconstitutional, nothing like that. Now, I personally have a, 
uh, some thoughts about um about this issue though about uh, whether about whether every a case was always heard in its totality on a single day i have a question as to whether high profile public cases could be dealt with uh, on a single day and i think actually that in some cases the trial could extend overnight into the next day why as i've said we have multiple prosecutors uh in cases we know that for a fact and they would tend to give very long speeches for example in 323 bc uh demosthenes the orator was put on trial for treason this was a trumped up charge as had been the one against socrates but demosthenes was a major public figure if he had been put on trial today court tv would have had a field day with him now demosthenes was prosecuted by 10 men Okay, and they were appointed by the state, so these would have been those sunegaroi, those public prosecutors. And we have one fairly um, extant prosecution speech from this trial. That is, it's more or less intact. We have most of it. And one speech that is horribly fragmented. We only have about a third of it. But the first one, that is the one that's reasonably extant, reasonably complete, takes up to about 30 pages in the OCT, the Oxford Classical Text, uh, Greek. And it couldn't have been given in just a few minutes. Now, not all of the 10 prosecutors, those 10 sunegaroi, uh, might have spoken for the same length of time. Some might have just stood up and said, find him guilty, gentlemen of the jury, and then sat down again. But when we think about 10 prosecution speeches, plus all manner of supporting evidence, uh, it is hard for me to imagine uh, all of that fitting into a two-hour and 12-minute limit. Demosthenes himself would have spoken at length in his defense. Demosthenes was actually known for his verbosity. Uh, and here he was on trial for treason, so he wasn't going to be terse. We don't have his speech for this trial, but the prosecution speeches that we do have, and I just mentioned two of them, refer to Demosthenes using character witnesses. And these would have taken time. And then there is the matter of how long it would have taken the jury to vote and for their ballots to be counted, because the jury at Demosthenes' trial numbered 1,501, so it's very large. On top of all of that, in the classical period, a new word comes into existence, dekazdain. Uh, it has a specialized meaning, and the meaning is this, large-scale bribery of jurors. Okay, The word deka in Greek means 10, but dekazdain in a legal sense is more than just 10. It means large-scale bribery of jurors. Now, you don't have a word for something unless that something is there okay unless there's unless there's a, a referent for it unless something is happening why would you create this word it would be impossible to bribe the jurors at a regular trial because no one could predict who would be selected for that day the selection process as we saw was arbitrary with that kind of lottery like machine so there was little point in trying to bribe anyone unless you bribed all of the men you know thousands of men turning up at daybreak wanting to be selected for jury duty but if a trial went into a second day and you see where i'm going with this and that same jury reconvened on day two which it would have done then you all you had to do that night was to to was to kind of cozy up to the jurors and then only bribe those ones who you know were going to be reconvening the next day on top of that, there's also an ominous line in the Athenian constitution that after the introduction of jury pay in the 450s, corruption began. Clearly corruption began, it says. The Athenian constitution tells us this. Well, how on earth can you corrupt the jurors when you had this arbitrary and haphazard selection process? There's something else going on behind the scenes. So the length of a political trial, actually, in my opinion, is very interesting in many respects. And it shows us, I think, that there's nothing clear cut when it comes to dealing with ancient history. Uh, you know, so many things are uh, a matter of interpretation, a kind of a matter of detective work, even the length of the trial. Uh, you could write an entire article about it, and I'm sure people probably have. And so we move on now then to the speeches of prosecution and defense, which would have been kind of a major, major aspect of the trial. These would have been very different from those of today. We have a good number of actual forensic speeches that have survived. We don't have hundreds, as I've said before, or anything like that. And there must have been thousands and thousands of them uh, that were delivered in the courts over the century and a half from Ephialtes in 462 down to the abolition of democracy by the Macedonians in 322. Uh, so, you know, 140 years there. Today, we have only a fraction of them. 
Uh, if you're interested in reading of them, there's a very good collection of them uh, in a book called Trials from Classical Athens by Christopher Carey. Um, and uh, he also gives a very good introduction in this book, summarizing the legal system. It's a good book to dip into, and I would recommend it if you're interested in, in everything I've been talking about tonight. Uh, and in this book, he has about two dozen or so speeches that are translated from a variety of suits. He has that case on the adultery, one that I mentioned before, uh, one's on assault and battery, inheritance matters, slander, business, and commerce. Um, it even includes that one I referenced a little while ago about Naira, who was uh, a woman prosecuted for allegedly passing off her illegitimate children as legitimate Athenian citizens. Um, and it is interesting by the way, it's kind of on a side note, that with the exception of two highly political showpiece trials, all our other extant speeches are, are either the prosecution one or the defense one in a particular case. We never have both sides, with, with the exception of two very, very political showpiece trials. We don't have the prosecution and defense except in those two. Perhaps the reason why we only have prosecution or defense and not and is so many private is because so many private trials are minor public ones. Uh, uh, the ones we do have today were the successful ones. So either the prosecution one or the defense one in any of those cases. So there was no need to record and circulate for posterity of the speeches that failed. That is my interpretation. It's a possibility. If this is true, though, um, uh, that that does seem to. Uh, castle, you know, that, that gives us a way of interpreting those speeches then. So if we, the one on adultery, the, where the man is defending himself for killing the man who, you know, who is having an affair with his wife, that pro that would imply that he probably won that case. Um, as for the highly political showpiece trials that I just mentioned, both of them have Demosthenes as their central figure facing off against his political opponent, Aeschines. The first one of these speeches is from 343 BC, and the second uh, one is from 330 BC. And I want to talk about these trials when we deal with Demosthenes himself later in a, in a subsequent lecture. Much of the content of the speeches that we have today would have been ruled inadmissible <laughs> and probably have the speaker fined for contempt of court or even disbarment today. Uh, why? Slander of opponents was prevalent, and indeed it was enjoyed. You could tell, you could call someone a wife beater, a murderer of his parents, a sycophant, uh, and with no grounds of support for your allegation at all. And all of these things would have been totally admissible. They were. And for the most part, you could get away with all of this personal invective, a patriotic appeals for Athens' glorious past, especially for the defeat of the Persians, gossip, innuendo. Uh, all of that were part and parcel of a forensic speech, and they were relished by the jurors. Perhaps the worst rhetorical technique is the argument of probability. And this was used ad nauseum. I actually mentioned this uh, within the context of our discussion of the rise of rhetoric, but we can see a few more things about it. Uh, we can say a few more things about it here. For example, if someone were on trial for, let's say, stealing a sheep, and he had done this sort of thing before, then probably, heavily underlined, he was guilty this time around too, and so should be found guilty. The prosecutor might run a line such as, gentlemen of the jury, um, we all know this man has been convicted of stealing a sheep before. We all know one of my own sheep is missing right now, so there's no question he probably took it and you should find him guilty. Uh, now that would not that kind of line of argument would not be allowed in a law court nowadays, but uh, it was back then, and it is therefore no wonder that Plato, for example, condemned the argument based on probability, and he pleaded that people should take into account only the facts and only the laws, and not be swayed by rhetoric. Of course, he was disregarded uh, because just as rhetoric often ruled the assembly. A great oral performance in the law courts could mask a weak case and make the weaker argument appear the stronger. And so rhetoric ruled the domain of the law courts as well. A skillful speaker could also use laws that had no bearing on the case so as to denigrate his opponent. In 345 BC, for example, the orator Aeschines, whom I just mentioned a moment ago, prosecuted a man named Timarchus under a procedure called the Dokimasia ton retoron, which means scrutiny of public speakers. So anyone who speaks in the assembly, in other words. 
Demarcus was a speaker in the assembly, a politician in other words, and he was also an opponent of Aeschylus. Speakers' personal lives were an item of concern for the Athenians, and so Aeschylus took advantage of the fact that Demarcus was, or at least had been, a male prostitute. And Aeschylus prosecuted Demarcus on these grounds of being a male prostitute. Um, now, this sort of job was especially scorned by the Athenians, uh, especially considered because it would involve being in the passive role. And uh, for the Athenians, they made a big distinction between the active and the passive role in this kind of relationship. And um, uh, Aeschylus' charges, therefore, was a political one against an opponent, but to lend weight to his case, Aeschylus invokes all these laws that have nothing to do with the actual charge, laws like protecting children from prostitution and regulating conduct in schools and the gymnasia and so on. And this sort of thing would be totally thrown out of court nowadays, I would imagine, uh, for lack of relevance or for being unduly prejudicial. But the jurors of Demarcus' time lapped it up because they found him guilty, and we know that for a fact. It was also common for defendants to parade their wives and children through court, crying and gnashing their teeth in an attempt to gain sympathy, uh, the sympathy of the jurors. Socrates actually mentions this explicitly at his trial in 399 BC when he says that he's going to be different from other litigants because he will not resort, he will not um, bring himself to such a uh, nadir of dignity uh, and resort to that practice. But Socrates was in a minority, and this parading of children and wives does give rise to actually something that we do know about from other sources of people hiring out their own children to look as if the defendant had a whole tribe of kids, and the jury would have, you know, would therefore feel uh, sympathy, you know, and the need to acquit that person. Uh, otherwise, who would look after the unfortunate wife with all those children around? Another difference also between then and now given the large size of jurors in Athens, and these could often, as I said, run over a thousand, was the noise level and the ability to hear properly. We've mentioned this already in the context of the ecclesia, the assembly meetings, uh, which were attended by thousands of citizens, but, but the courts were no different in terms of being able to hear what went on. Today, a jury has to sit quietly, and if there is any noise in the courtroom, the judge bangs his gavel, her gavel, to restore order, and everyone can hear it properly. But not so back then. Uh, for one thing, as in the assembly, there was no public address system to allow a large audience to hear a speaker properly. And those jurors who were sitting further away from the speaker simply could not hear as clearly as those who were sitting closer. Moreover, some might be chatting amongst themselves, perhaps asking the person next to them what the speaker had just said. Some got distracted in other ways, such as eating their lunch, we know that they would take their lunch with them because it was an all-day event, and maybe even watching the birds fly overhead, because remember, all the courts were outside. So, um, you know, how on earth would you be able to hear one of the prosecution speeches delivered by Demosthenes, or indeed Demosthenes' defense speech in 323, when you were sitting among 1,501 jurors, and you might be sitting next to you know, some guy who's really chatty and, you know, talking about his lunch or <laughs> and you were at a great distance from those who were speaking, you simply couldn't hear what was going on. Speakers did not stop if jurors got distracted. And I do believe, although, as I said, much to my regret, I have never been a member of a jury. A jury. I do believe, though, that today a member of a modern jury can ask a question during a case. He can ask for a point of order or clarification uh, but back then, if the jury wanted to talk amongst itself, if it wanted to ask a question, what do you mean by that? I didn't quite get that. It simply uh, lost track of what the speakers were saying and because they did not stop. And that meant that by the time that you had asked the person sitting next to you, hey, what did he just say? I missed it. And you got your reply. Then the speaker was already well on to uh, his next subject. And that meant that now both you and the guy sitting next to you had lost track of what was going on. Prosecution and defense had to be very careful, though, to make sure that the jurors did not become too confused or indeed too annoyed from the speeches, the contents of which they couldn't hear, because then the jury might react adversely to the speaker. That's the very last thing somebody wanted to happen. That's perhaps why speakers encourage the jurors to shout, to applaud, or jeer at certain times. There was even a rhetorical technique called a thorobos, a Greek word which means uproar. Uh, 
And the courts seem to have been something like, a, you know, I don't know, a Jerry Springer show or something like that, if you know, if you can catch that reference, uh, with the audience often being out encouraged to shout when the hero, you know, does something, you know, good or he walks out on stage and boo when the villain appears and everybody, you know, enjoys doing this and kind of creating great hullabaloo. Um, it's hardly a surprise then that the anti-hero in Aristophanes' Wasps says that he enjoys being a juror for the entertainment value. Perhaps somewhat similar today, though, uh, although handed, handled differently, is the sense of dramatic immediacy in the speeches that we have. Because speakers will often address the jurors directly, and they will challenge them to find a defendant guilty, or if it is a defendant speaking to, he will challenge the jurors to find him innocent. These speakers make it seem like the jury is on trial. They, make, they might run a line such as, if you acquit him, gentlemen of Athens, what will you say to your wife and your family when you go home today? Or they might say, although you're judging this man, gentlemen of the jury, the whole of the city, indeed the whole of Greece, is judging you. Today, attorneys in court look at jurors when they make their opening and closing statements or when questioning those on the stand. Uh, and remember, in classical Athens, there was no cross-examination. And attorneys today might try to work on the jury's emotions before uh, the judge intervenes. At least that's what happens in the movies. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, However, this is a very different kind of thing from how speakers would whip up a jury in classical Athens. They really did encourage them to yell, to shout, to applaud, and to take part in the case. To us, then, the Athenian court system might still seem very amateurish and almost like going to a theater yet or even a daytime talk show um yet having said all that jurors did take their dicastic oath very seriously as we discussed at some length in a previous lecture and the people as a whole recognized the importance of law and city life and how the safety of the city rested on the laws uh remember that for that word isonomia equality before the law okay the rule of law that was so you know, one of the most important political buzzwords of the Athenian vocabulary. So the classical judicial system shouldn't really be called inferior to ours. As I've said before, we should just talk about it merely being different. And we should recognize that without it, we wouldn't enjoy the rights and privileges and the recourse to law and appeal and third party uh, arbitration that we have and take for granted today. In uh, now, Having said all that, in conclusion, I mentioned before that the 4th century BC was one of great change for the Greek world. And so it is in our next lectures, we are going to return to what brought about that change, namely Macedon. And in particular, we're going to look first under Philip II, who was king from 359 to 336 BC, and then under his son, Alexander the Great, who was king from 336 to 323 Indeed, we have no choice but to turn to Macedonia now, because while we have been discussing all sorts of legal changes and cases that were taking place in the later 4th century BC, Macedonia was already starting its encroach on Greek autonomy, and it is to their story now uh, and to the final chapter of our course that we will now turn. Thank you.